Good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, sometimes when you sit down and listen to people introduce you, and they start saying all these nice things about you, you start looking around and say, who, who are they talking about? You know, <laughs> I, I, all those nice things. Um, Jim is a good friend of mine, so yeah. Go back a lot of years. Uh, I want to thank um, the coaching staff and athletic department uh, and my good friend Jim for inviting me to come over here. Uh, this is, it really is an honor. I mean, this stacks up there with me, with the birth of my kids, and the Saints win the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not the Saints win the Super Bowl. Nothing stacks up to that point, I'll tell you. Nothing stacks up to the Saints win the Super Bowl. Um, before I get started, I think that sometimes it's, you know, when you're going before a crowd, especially a lot of people that you don't know, it's, um, it's sometimes it's customary to just do what they call it is the icebreaker. Okay, so if you guys would indulge me, and we're going to do what a little, what we call an icebreaker. Okay, now I need for everybody to participate in this. Do you know the the song, the Bingo song? I had a little dog, and Bingo was the name. Do you know that song? Okay, so I want you guys to participate with me in the Bingo song. This is icebreaker. You ready? I'm going to start, you pop in. I had a little dog, and Bingo was his name. B-I-N-G-O. B-I-N-G-O. And Bingo was his name. I had a little cat, and Tommy was his name. T-O. 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 And Tommy was his name. I had a little bunny, and Ezekiel was his name. Easy. <laughs> All right. So everybody, everybody is really kind of the ice is broke, right? The ice is broke. Uh, as Jim said, I came here in 1969. I was born in Flora, Mississippi, and the center of the girls. And the girls' basketball team, you guys have gone over and played Jackson State. Well, Flora is about 15 miles north of Jackson. But in 1950, it may have well been 1,500 miles north of Jackson. Uh, this was uh, during segregation, I mean, extreme segregation in the South, and Jim Crow, and sharecropping. Now, if you don't know what sharecropping is, sharecropping is when Someone owned all the land. They provided the tools and the resources for a family to, to work the land. And they would work the land, and when they finished and harvest the crop, they shared in the profit. Now, a lot of folks back in those days said that was just a, another form of, of uh, slavery because you could not question how much you owed. And, and, and you could not, you were just bound to the land because you always was in debt and you couldn't leave the land until you paid off the debt. And so it was just over and over and over again. So that's where I was born, 1950. I was born into a mother, I was the eighth of 10 kids, the eighth of 10. There was, we lived in a, uh, a four room house. Uh, there was a, uh, it had a tin top to it. There was a fireplace. But uh, there was a front room that, that uh, was a living room, bedroom. There was a kitchen. There was another kind of a large room that was a bedroom and a real small room that was a bedroom. Now, you notice I didn't say anything about a bathroom. We didn't have running water. We didn't have uh, indoor plumbing. Uh, we had to catch water off the house that ran off the top of the house when it rained. And we used that water to bathe and to wash with. And then we would have to uh, hitch the mules up to the wagon and go down and draw water from a hydrant. And that water we used for drinking and cooking. Uh, we, uh, the first school that I went to was a three-room school. It was called Shady Grove. It said Shady Grove Elementary, but that three-room school went all the way from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. Three rooms, kindergarten, first, second, and third, and one room, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and another room, and seven and eight, and the third room. 
you notice, I said, I had no bathroom. There was no cafeteria, there was no nothing. Everything was, we had a stove, a big pot belly stove in the middle of the, uh, the rooms, and that's what we used for heat. The first book that I ever had, had about 12 to 15 names in it. And a lot of these books had pages that was missing, and it was really, really outdated. So that was the life that I, that I, I was born into. In our house, there was my mom, an older brother, three older sisters, myself, and a younger brother. My father was not a part of my life when I grew up. I did not know who he was, and, and I can't say what he did for me or us or not. I don't know. But uh, he was not a part of my life. My mom was the person that, that raised me. Uh, so all of us that lived in that house, and I don't know how, what type of sleeping arrangement that we had, but <laughs> we, we got by. You know, I, didn't, I didn't feel like we was all poor or we, did, we were struggling because everybody around there lived just like that. Every other African-American family that lived around there, we all lived just like that. Some families did a little bit better than the others because they had a, a, a father that was there and he was able to provide a little bit more, but we all was in the same boat. And so that's where I did and we started, started growing up and and um, see, I, I always say, I'm looking back on when I was a little nappy-headed boy, and I didn't, only thing I worried about is when, when, we, when do we eat? When is the next meal? I didn't worry about anything else, when was the next meal? And so, but we all had chores. And when I run, got to be about six years old, my, my first chore was to carry water to the people that was working in the fields. I did that around about 10 o'clock in the morning, did it again around about 12 o'clock when they we would stop to eat, and by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and the rest of the time I could be playing. Now, I was a pretty big kid for my age, so I would take that water to these people in the field, and then I would, this bucket it had a dipple, and I would give the, 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 the bucket and the dipper to the people, and I would take the hole from the, uh, and hold the hole. But not me. I thought that. Chopping cotton and working in the field, it looked like it was fun. It looked like it was a lot of fun. So one day, I took that hoe and I started chopping cotton. And I can remember it just like it was yesterday, because this changed my life. My mom said, you know, that boy is handling that hoe well. And the next day, I had a job. The very next day, instead of laying in bed and waiting, get up and eating and then playing around till 10 o'clock. Now, I had to get up at 5.30 in the morning and go to the, the fields with the people. I'd get there at 6 o'clock and work all the way from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Then you got a break. Then you work from 1 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Uh, now, there was 12 hour days and uh, 11 hours were spent working in the cotton field. Uh, there's no shade, there's no nothing out there in the field. You just was out there. It was excruciating. And for a six-year-old, wow, I got a couple of beatdowns <laughs> for not keeping up because I just couldn't see it. I, I just couldn't see it. But I just, I grew and I grew. And now the school that I was going to, uh, 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 they changed because they, the high school that all the kids from these surrounding areas, what happened is they had their little school, Shady Grove, but every little community had a, a three-room school just like that. When everybody left there, they went to the high school that was in the town. But uh, the high school burnt down, and then the county had to build a new school for all the kids, for African-American kids to come through, East Flora High School. That school went from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, and there was about 700 kids throughout the county that went all the way there. And now at East Rover, and I met a gentleman. I didn't know at that time that was gonna have a profound effect on my life. His name was Gene Henderson. Mr. Henderson, he, he coached basketball, football, baseball, track. He did all of those things. Now he went to Alcorn University and he was like a, a kicker at Alcorn. He didn't play basketball, but he was the basketball coach. And he's the man that introduced me to basketball. I'm lined up in the hallway, going from class to class, and I'm standing head and shoulders above everybody else. 
And he came up and he said, say, mister, what's your name? I said, my name is E.C. Coleman. He said, you ever played basketball? Well, I lied. Yeah, I played basketball. I had never had a basketball in my hand before then. So I lied, and he said, okay, well, who's your teacher? And I told him, and he would come and get me. But he couldn't take, take me, he had to take the whole class. And we'd go to the gym, and he introduced me to basketball. And I began to pick it up, pick it up. Gene Henderson saw something in me that maybe not, he, he just took interest in me. Now, it might have been because he's a basketball coach, and he could see that with this guy here, going to go, he's going to grow on up, and I have a pretty good basketball player. And I uh, began to learn how to play basketball. But I still had to work the fields. And the way we did that was, uh, during the cotton picking times, is two of us would stay at home, and three of us would go to school on Monday and Tuesday, I mean Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and the other ones would go to school on Tuesday, Thursday, and then we just flip it over the, the next week. And then on Saturday, everybody went to the field and worked at 12 o'clock, and then you had an opportunity. After sharecropping, then you start working by the day. Working by the day is that you just go, somebody hire you, and you go work for them by the day. And I'm gonna tell you this right here, my first working by the day, you worked for, it was $3 a day. Now that might say $3 a day. Now, I never saw any of that money because my mom always got it, but it was $3 a day. And so when you put out my mom, my three sisters, myself, and my brother, you know, you, those $3 will add up. And that's how we supported ourselves. Uh, and we also raised chickens and hogs and had a garden, that kind of stuff there. When I reached the ninth grade, well, let me read very back. In the eighth grade, I tried out for the varsity basketball team and I made it. Now, as an eighth grader from the varsity basketball team, I didn't get to play that much that year, but I was on that team. Now, I want to point this out. I'm in eighth grade. Here's a guy that's a senior in high school on another team. Now, now I'm a senior. This guy I'm going on and graduated from college. Now, the other coach would see, I know that boy. That boy has got to be too old. He got to be too old. He was here when Thomas Anderson was here. And Thomas Anderson graduated from, he got to be too old. So every year I had to prove that I wasn't over age to play basketball. But I made that basketball team and uh, uh, I, I, I got some experience. I would get in, you know, we play a junior high school game, a junior varsity game, and then I sit on the bench and if it was a blowout either way, I get a few minutes to play. But for my eighth grade year to my freshman year, I made my second major mistake. I had to decide what elective I'm going to take going into high school. And there was only four, band, home economics, shop, and typing. Well, I, I, I'm not gonna be in the band because I wanna play football. And I'm a he man, I'm not going into no typing or no home economics. Now, fellas, you understand that the mentality of this, that's where all the girls was, but that, that's not me. <laughs> I, I'm going to take shop. And the, the, the advisor, he told me, he said, you see, look, you, you think about going to college? I said, yeah, I might I'm go to. He said, well, if you go to college, you're going to need typing. <laughs> I don't need no typing. <laughs> I'm going to go do some shop. So I went into shop. Now, I want y'all to remember that. Uh, but after my freshman year in school, I went to Upward Bound. Anybody heard of Upward Bound? Upward Bound is a program where they take the high school kids and break them on college campus, and they introduce them to a lot of different stuff. Well, I went to Upward Bound at Tukaloo uh, University there in, in uh, Tukaloo, Mississippi. And one thing that you had to do was read a book. Now I'm gonna tell you this right here. Up until that point, I had never, ever read a book. I read chapters in a book, and maybe before the end of the school year, I might have read a whole book, but I had never picked up a book to read for pleasure or for information, I did. And I went on to uh, uh, Tukaloo campus, and I saw a, um, a book in the library. It, it was called Black Boy. By Richard Wright. 
And I picked that book up and I had finished reading it in two days. I went back to the library. I got a, another book by Richard Wright called Native Son. I read that book. And it, it, my, my way of thinking changed. And I went and got a book by James Baldwin. You know, go tell it on the mountain. I got that book and I read all those, those three books within three weeks period of time. Now, that's, that's a lot for a person that had never, ever, ever read a book. That changed the way I was thinking. It made me acutely aware of what it meant to be black in the South, or just black in America. It changed the way. And in my mind, I began to become a little bit of a radical. In my mind, I became a radical, you know. And I'm gonna tell you this right here. All the way up until that point, every contact that I had ever had with a white person was a negative contact. There was nothing positive. And everything that I ever heard about white people and all the stuff that was happening around me was negative when it came to black and white interaction. So I, be, I was a radical in my mind. But I was in this little, small town. I was in this cocoon of conservatism. My mom was conservative. I went to church three or four times a week. And say, so, so I, I'm in here, and I, there's no way, no place, no way for me to really to expand on this radicalism that I was having. You know, this awareness, this black awareness. It was beginning, people began to talk about, you know, uh, being black and being proud of being black. I, 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 just, I just wasn't, you know, couldn't get out there. They was marching in, in the streets. There was a march all the way from Memphis to Jackson, Mississippi, and I wanted to go participate in that. No, you can't do that because my mom feared what would happen if they found out that I was participating in something like that. So there I was, a radical, stuck into this little conservative environment. And one day, my mom asked me to meet her at the store. Now, it's a hard, it's a hard of summer, and it's really, really hot. And inside that store, it's air conditioned. You ain't have no air conditioning at our place. And I wanted to go inside the store. She told me, no, don't go inside. And when she got to the store, she waited. She looked in the store. She looked and looked and waited till that man was by himself. And she told me, said, wait here. I'll tell you when to come in. Now, I disobeyed my mom. I stepped inside the store where she couldn't see me to get some of this air conditioning. And I saw something, my mom do something that crushed me. It really just broke me down to, I, I'm telling you, I had tears in my eyes. I, could, I can't tell you how bad I felt for my mom and for myself. And I, my mom put her hands like this, and she, 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 she walked up to this man, like this right here, and in a voice that was so, it was trembling, almost on the verge of crying, just, just so pitiful. It's, I, I was just crushed. Mr. Franklin, can you please let me have some groceries for my kids? Mr. Franklin, you know I don't have no money. You know I pay for it. Boy, I'm telling you, my mom was supposed to do that. My mom was the strongest person I ever know. My mom was supposed to reach and grab me in the car. Look, I'm going to get some of these groceries. I ain't going to pay you when I go to you here. That's the way I felt about my mom. But now my mom is done bent down to, and this old thing, oh. She got the groceries, we headed home. And I, that was the time me and my mom always conversate when I, I was the one that, we, that went, did stand for her. And I'm not saying a word. And she knew something was wrong. And she said, what's the matter? Nothing. She said, oh, come on, I know something's the matter. Come on, would you please just tell me what's the matter? Boy, I put them groceries down and I lit into my mom. Mama, we got to stop begging the white man. We got to stop how he's going to ever respect us if we keep on begging him, stuff like I said. He don't never respect us. We got to be able to stand up on our own two feet and all. She just let me go on for a little while. And then she hit me across the head with a two by four. <laughs> now, not literally a two by four. This is what she said to me. You're going to eat, ain't you? And that was like a supernova had bust in my head. <laughs> Boom in my head. Yeah, that's right. We, we are. We're going to eat. And she said something. My mom was, I, she was a wise lady. She said, 
look, I know that man up there is a racist. I know that if he was with his friends and if I caught on fire, he would not throw in the water on me. But I waited till he was by himself. Then I appealed to the racist. I appealed to the man inside that racist. I made it possible for him to be a human being and to do something nice. Now, that was my mom who only went to the third grade saying these things to me. She gave a speech that I learned when I got here was called a lost cause speech. A lost cause speech. Now, fellas, I'm going to tell these fellas here, maybe some of the girls, uh, give you an example of lost cause speech. You got this girl that you like, you want to take her out. And she's been, been after this girl all the time. And finally, she said, OK, I'll go out with you. And you go out, and you go for the movie, you, go, you have a good time, and you get back to her place. And she said, oh, good night. And you say, what? Is that it? <laughs> now, what you do then, you give that lost call speech, <laughs> try to convince her that this is not the end of the date. So that's what a lost call speech is. Now, I know some of you guys are laughing. You must have had one just, <laughs> just recently. A lost cause speech. My mom gave a lost cause speech, and she was able to provide some food for her family. Uh, after that, I, I, my radicalism was kind of like throwing some water on it, and I, I began to understand what my situation is and how we live what the limitations of my situation was, so I kind of calmed down a little bit. Still had it here, but I understand. I understood a little bit more. The, the wisdom of my mom, that's my son just walked in, and my grandson, everybody. <laughs> and there's my daughter over there, too. I, uh, that's how important this situation is to us, to have my daughter here, my wife. You can't get her out of New Orleans to come. To come. She came and had my son and my grandson. This, this is great. But anyway, I couldn't be radical no more. And I went on and started playing basketball. And because of my family, I, uh, I, each summer, I was able to get a good job. When I say a good job, it was a job that grown men would have and, and took care of their family. And that is a recipe for dropping out of school back in those days. Mind you, I'm the eighth of 10, and I'm the first to graduate from high school. All my sisters and brothers prior to that had never, ever finished school, OK? I had a brother that, uh, that uh, didn't know how to read or write. So uh, I'm getting these jobs. And every year, this is how Gene Henderson come in and had an effect on my life. Every fall, he would come and find me. Not at my house, he would come on the job that I was working. And it, mister, uh, are you gonna come back to school? I don't know, Mr. Hellenstein, I'm, I'm working and stuff, I need to help my mom. Well, I understand that, I understand that. But tell me, is this what you wanna do for the rest of your life? And I would think. And I said, no, I don't wanna do this the rest of my life. And when school started, I would go back to school. But he had, to do it, he had to do it three times, because three times I had that job. And each one of those jobs was a better job than I had the last the year before. And he would come, and he gave me the same speech. Mister, look how close you are. Look, mister, you got an opportunity. You can, play, you can go play college basketball. Well, I didn't think about that. All I wanted to do was graduate from high school. I had, the only thing that I had about school, all the thing I would think about, just see me out of here. I didn't, want to try to, I didn't even try to make an A. I just wanted to pass, get a passing grade that I could move on and stay up to play basketball and football. And finally, one day, a Saturday, it's pouring rain. I mean rain, is, I mean, it's, when they said cats and dogs, I, I literally thought cats and dogs were falling. And I heard, <laughs> who's that? And my sister opened the door, and there was these two white men. They looked like FBI agents. It was clean cut. I mean, not a hair out of place. Just, just clean cut. 
Do, uh, do E.C. Coleman live here? My mom turned to me and my brother. What did y'all do? What did you do? Those gentlemen was Gerald Miles and Lenny Riches from Houston Baptist Conference. And they came in and they told my, told my mom that they had heard about me and they, at Houston Baptist and they were going to recruit me to come to Houston Baptist on a basketball scholarship. Boy, I'm telling you the truth. They were the first to come to recruit it. They told me they said Baptist College and started talk about some of the classes they were going to take. I don't care if anybody could have come with a, a truckload of money. I was sold on coming to Houston Baptist. And we went over to the gym and I worked out and, and, and um, uh, they saw me play. And, and uh, I didn't see Coach Miles anymore until I came to sign at, at the school. But London Richards would come see me play. He said, uh, 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 a guy that you know uh, said he was a friend of yours. He told us about you. His name is Eddie Brown. I, I, don't, I don't know no Eddie Brown. Yeah, he said he went to he went to the Rose Scott High School. He he, he said you know he said y'all been y'all been knowing each other ever since y'all was in junior high school. And I, I don't know no no Eddie Brown. Said, yeah, he said, he, don't, he, he 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 says he know you. I don't know. Well, come to think think about it, it was Eddie Brown, but I knew him as Eddie Lewis. He went by his mom's maiden name when in high school. So that's the same Eddie Brown that some of you people might have known that was be on the sideline here. He's all-time leading scorer at this school. Uh, a great friend of mine. He passed away a couple, of years, a couple of years ago. I miss him. Eddie Brown told him about me, and they came over to recruit me. And Lionel Richard took me out to eat one time. Now, I had never been to a sit-down restaurant. I went to a burger place and ordered a burger and went and sit down and ate it somewhere, but I never went to a sit-down restaurant. And now I'm sitting in this place, and I had never, ever had a conversation with a white person in my life. I've had some interactions with them because I worked for them, but I never had a conversation. And now here's this white man on the other side of the table there talking to me, asking me questions. That's my opinion about stuff. That was strange for me. That was really, really strange. Because, mind you, in my mind, I'm still this radical. What do you want? I don't, I don't know something. I, I can't trust him, all this kind of stuff. All this kind of stuff. But when they got ready to order, I got that menu, and I looked at that menu, and it may have well been written in Greek. I'm telling you, I didn't understand nothing that was on this. I didn't know what to order. So I'm going to wait. My mom said, wait, just listen to what he says, and then you order what he order. You know, so, so, but he ordered something. I, 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 I didn't put too much on it. And I'm looking on him, and I saw ham steak. Ham steak, that's pretty good. I guess I know what a ham can't mess up that. So I order a ham steak. Then they, 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 the lady anyway, so well, um, said, um, you want a baked potato? Yeah, I have baked potatoes. Now, mind you guys, we didn't take uh, Irish potatoes and, and bake them. We took sweet potatoes to bake them. We had baked sweet potatoes. Yeah, give me a baked potato. Say, well, you want, you want to dress? Yeah, yeah, dress it up. They said, what, what kind of salad do you want? All the salads that I ever ate was potato salad. <laughs> never, <laughs> never, ever eating no green, tossed green salad. So, yeah, and then they asked me, he said, what kind of dressing do you want on it? Uh, I take what he's having. And <laughs> Coach Richards had wanted some blue cheese, a roll for dressing. Man, my mom told me, said, whatever you put in front of you, eat. Oh, you eat everything that you put in front of you. <laughs> now I got, uh, uh, a white potato stacked up with chives and cr cr cream. <laughs> Bellas, it was hard. It was hard. <laughs> it was hard. The only thing that I killed was that ham steak. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I killed the ham steak. But that other stuff, it was really, really hard. But need to say, on May 29th, I graduated from high school. And on June 2nd or 3rd, I was in college. On June 5th, I'm going to class a speech class. 
I got everything that I need. I got my notebook. I had to make sure that I had all the, all the things, pencils and pens and stuff. And I go into that class, and the gentleman, Mr. Mr. Dr. Reynolds, was the teacher. He came in there, and he's, he came in, and he speaks some, starts speaking some French. I guess right? everything they said, I didn't understand a word this man was talking about. He was talking so fast. I'm trying to take notes, but I, I, I can't. And I'm looking over here trying to figure out what's going on. I can't do it. And a harsh reality hit me. Ain't no way that I'm going to be able to make it in college. I'm just not ready. I, ain't no way. I'm telling you, I, I, there's no way. I'm not, I don't need to be even fooling myself. I, I'm not going to be able to make it. And so, I took that long walk back to the university departments over there, right there on the end on Beach Nut, on the corner of Beach Nut and Fondren, the one at the top, that's where I was staying. And finally got to a telephone to call my mom, to tell my mom that I was just going to quit and come home. And my mom said something that was so funny. I, I, I think that she might have been joking, but it really kind of hit me. Mom, I had tears. In my eyes, and the voice was trembling. Mama, uh, I, I want to come home. Why? I don't make it. My mom said, "You don't live here." <laughs> she said, "She said you moved." <laughs> Mama, she said, "Look, look, son. How you know you're gonna fail? How do you know that you're going to fail? You haven't even tried." Go and give it your best shot. You know, do your best. If you fail, you fail. But I didn't raise no quitter. You ain't gonna quit. Go, and we'll tell you what you do. Go ask somebody for some help. Remember that lost cause speech my mom gave? I went to Dr. Reynolds and gave him a lost cause speech. I told him what my situation was. I spoke to him, I told him about how I was brought up. I told him, you know, this, I told him everything. And he took an interest. He was. Fascinated with speech, how I talked and words that I used and, and sudden drawl and everything like that. And he said, okay, I'll help you. What he said was, okay. I was telling him I didn't understand all the big words you used. I'll tell you what, I'm going to help you with your vocabulary. What I'm going to do is that gave me a dictionary. He said, what I want you to do is find two words. Learn, you ain't got to learn how to spell them, but learn how to pronounce them, learn the meaning of them. And somewhere during the day, try to use those two words in a sentence. And I did that. He said, I tell you, what else I'm going to do? I'm going to get somebody to, you know, to, to help you with your notes, that you, that, you, that you copy their notes. And he did that. And then he said, and what I want you to do, you got to be here at every class, and you got to sit there, and you got to pay attention. And I'm going to emphasize the most important points so that you can get it. So I want you to hear it, the most important points. And I'll go over it a couple of times. That's what Dr. Runner did. That's the first. I gave him that lost cause speech, just like my mom gave that man a lost cause speech. She got the food, and I got the help that I needed. By the end of the summer, I felt a little bit more comfortable about uh, maybe I could make it into college. And I went on and uh, you know, did okay. After the first semester, I was on probation and all this kind of stuff here. But do they still have core here? Culture and human experience. They don't have that course here. That was, I seen that course make some kids that never ever had a blemish on their record cry. It was hard. <laughs> Combination of European history, philosophy, music, art, and stuff like that, y'all had to do it. Uh, and I had to take that course. And I tell you, the day that the last the final was over with, you know how they placed some grades outside that building? And I went over there one day, and I was just shaking because I'm not going to be eligible to play if I don't pass this course. I just wanted to see anything besides the F. And when I saw that D on that green, it was like, <laughs> it was like I had won the lottery, man. Wow, I passed. I didn't have to take it anymore. I got by that course, and I went on and played basketball. Here, I had a pretty good career here at uh, at Houston Baptist. I ended up second all-time leading scorer at this school, over 1,800-some points. But 
I also ended up with over almost 1,300 rebounds. That's unheard of today. I averaged almost 13 rebounds a game over a four-year period of time. If my son always said this here, I said, Dad, man, with the stats that you had, boys, you know, you'd be in the lottery. You'd be signing up. I mean, <laughs> you'd be like 40 mil, 40, 50 mil, something like that. <laughs> but that was, but that was such a time. And I got drafted. Well, one other thing happened. I think at the end of my junior year or sophomore year, the Houston, the Rockets moved from San Diego to Houston. And wouldn't you know they practice in Shawshank? And that's when I started believing that I had a chance to play professional basketball. Up until that time, these guys was way up there and I was somewhere down here. I, just, I didn't have really anything to marriage. I was good against these basketball players, these college players, but not against the pros. But when these guys started coming to Houston Baptist and I started playing against them, you know what? Yeah, that guy was an all-star last year and I'm, 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 I'm killing him. <laughs> you know, I'm killing it. And I started to believe that I could make it on the next level. And when I finish up my senior year, I, I remember I come over to the gym, was talking to Coach Richards, and he paid me the greatest compliment that anyone had ever paid me, before or after. I was telling the coaches all over. Four years. Yeah, buddy, it was a good ride. I said something, he said, I wish that I had 500 just like you. Now that's a hell of a compliment. For somebody to wish that they had 500 you. Man, I'm telling you, that's a great, anybody never paid that much compliment to me since then. I try to pay parents as my, my role as a teacher when I find a kid. I try to pay them the type of compliment when you find a kid that's doing the right thing. You know, working hard. I paid that parent a compliment. I went home to get my mom to bring her over here to my graduation. And we sat on the side of the bed and she was telling about, yo, I got a chance to play professional basketball and graduate and stuff like that. She said, she said, son, she said, I'm really proud of that. You know, you're my first one of the first of my kids to graduate from from high school and now you graduated from college and then now you're gonna go on and possibly play professional basketball. I'm really proud of that. But you know what I'm most proud of, son? She said, no one has ever come back and said anything negative about you and, and your brother. No one has ever come back and said that that boy did this, that boy did, them boys did this. They always said, so Gladys, those are some two really nice boys. My mama was most proud of that because that validated her as a parent. It made my mom feel good. It made her feel good that, wow, I did a good job. Other people can see the type of job that I did with, with my boys, with my children. Out of all these other things I had confidence, you think that she'd be jumping up and down, yeah, ain't gonna play. That was the one that she felt the best about. Now, I go to training camp right there in Sharp Gym and there's the Rockets that, that year before had the leading scoring team in the league, averaging almost 114 points a game. That's a lot. So I knew that if I'm gonna make this team, I may not be able to make it as a score because they ain't looking for no score. So every day I come and I worked hard and in the paper, they were always speculating where they got this forward, that forward, that forward, this forward. And they were trying to pick, figure out which one of these draft choices is going to fit into the Rockets lineup. But nothing about EC. Nothing about EC. They were writing stories about all these type of guys, everything. It was just like nothing. And I would go home and I would say, well, when I go back, I'm probably going to be cut. And I come back, walk into that gym, walk to that locker, and open it up. My stuff be there. I just get dressed and going out and practice. Now, I we went through preseason and everything is down to the last cut and things like this. It's just two guys left. Two. We know that the, the number one draft choice is going to be on the team, but just two guys left for one position. And I knew this was going to be me because they've been writing stories about this other guy. I mean, he's from North Dakota State. I've been writing, they write stories about him every day, how well he was doing, how this, that, how he fit. He could be the extra guard that, uh, uh, he could swing men, all these types of stuff. 
and I came over to the church, and I'm telling you, from walking from over there to over here, I'm telling you, I, 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 was, I was scared. My legs were shaking. I walked into the gym, and I walked in, and I opened the locker, and my stuff was there. Nobody told me, congratulations, you done made the team. My stuff was just there. And I went on out and went to practice. I looked around, he wasn't there. So I knew I had made the team. Now, I made the team, we go and we playing games. I'm not getting that one second of playing time. I was the guy that was dunking in warm up, you know. I was, <laughs> I, I, I was the, the double, you know, woo, I was doing every type of stuff. That's the only time I could shine is in warm up. And I go to the end of the bench and sat. But we go to New York, and the Knicks had a great team. They came off the 1972 championship team. They had a great team. And at halftime, now, you think about this right here. He is a, a little boy that was born in Mississippi in 1950 in a house that was no running water, all the way this stuff here, share crop, his mules to a plow, all the way up, and now I'm standing in Madison Square Garden. 19,500 people are there. And here I am sitting on a basketball team, professional basketball team. And down there is Willis Reed, the Earl of Pearl of Monroe, Walt Frazier, Dave Busher, Bill Bradley, all of those said uh, Dick Barnett, a championship team. And here I am sitting down here with the Rockets. And at halftime, we had 31 point lead. <laughs> I'm going to get to play. <laughs> I'm going to get, get to play because I know that they, we're going to come out for the next first five minutes of the game and then they're going to put the, put the, the scrubs in and, and we're going to go out there and I'm going to play. But if you like basketball, you would have loved to see the Knicks play that second half. I'm telling you, Pearl was spinning and Frazier was still in the bush from the corner, Bradley from the top of the key, Willis Reed in the center, block a shot, fast break. It was just beautiful basketball. And with six seconds to go, we only had a one-point lead, and they had the ball. Johnny Egan was his coach. He's there trying to wrap out something. He said, E.C., I want you to go in. I want you to guard the guy that's throwing the ball in. So, all right, I'm in the game. I go in, and I get out there, and I jump up and down, and I jump up and down, and finally I look over there, and they shoot, they miss, and we win the game. And then the next day, the next day, man, in the New York Times, there was an article talking about and recapping the game. And it said at the bottom of that article, with six seconds to go, Johnny Egan put E.C. Coleman in the game for defensive purposes. My first time. You, can you imagine this? In the New York Times, I got my name. <laughs> my name, not just E.C., not Coleman. E.C. Coleman in the New York Times for defensive purposes. And then for the next four or five games, I didn't play a second. And then fate intervened. We went to Portland on the West Coast sw swing. Rudy got hit in the nose on the jump ball. They didn't know he had a broken nose or not. He was, he was out. Cliff Mealy had a stomach virus. He didn't dress out, so they left. Jack Mary, Ron Riley, and myself as forwards. They used to use Ed Radliff as a swing man. He'd come back and, back and forth. Okay, Ron Riley get in foul trouble, and Jack Mary get thrown out of the game. Now, it's about two minutes gone in the, in the, in the, in the third quarter. Uh, this, is, this, is, this, this actually happened. You got 60 seconds to put somebody in the game. Coach walking back now. He looked at me. <laughs> he, he walked over. He walked over. Beep, beep, beep. Coach, you got to put somebody in the game. Uh. <sighs> Come on, you see, go in. I jumped up. I went into the game. And when you know, I played well. I had a good game for the rest of the game. I did what I was supposed to do. The next night, we was in Golden State, and everybody's back. There I was, down on the end of the bench. Cassie Russell was a guy that went to the University of Michigan. Now, Cassie Russell couldn't jump that high. He walked around like this. 
he could shoot the basketball. He could score the basketball. He wasn't going to put it on the floor but once or twice or something like that, but he's going to run you off the pick and he's going to spot up. And he, if you left him open, he was going to shoot 70, 70 80 percent if you left him open. And Cassie Russell was lighting us up. He lit up Jack Marin. He lit up Ron Rod. He lit up Clear for me. He lit up. He lit up they, they put Mike Newland down on him and stuff. They did everybody on him. And then finally, about three minutes gone, again in the third quarter, John Egan called timeout and he was filming. Man, Cassie Russell, if you cut off his right hand, he'll start it there. Can't nobody do something. I can't believe this here. You can't stop Cassie Russell. I, I, EC, go in there and see whether you can throw some water on him. <laughs> cool him off. I jumped up, went in there. He only scored four points for the rest of the game. He only scored those because I got tired. The difference between, <laughs> it's, a, it's a difference between game shape and, y'all know it, that you can run all you want and lift all you want, but it's a different intensity in the game. I got a little tired, they had to call the timeout stuff like to give me a breather, but I was on him. I was all over him, I stopped him. Next game we played, as soon as somebody started getting off, EC, go get him. And I started going in there, putting the clamps on him, putting the clamps on him. <laughs> all right, then, you know, from game after game, one day then he called me to the office and said, look, I apologize. And I'm wondering what he apologized for. He said, I'm, I, we've been putting you in a, a terrible position. We let guys get off, then you got to go in there and try to stop them. We're going to start you. We don't want them to get off. And that's when I got my break. Went out there, and that year I made the all-defensive team, all-rookie team. Then I ended up getting shipped down to New Orleans in the expansion draft. Got down there, made the all-rookie team, I mean all-defensive team for two years. Uh, but that taught me one thing. That every player, and I'm talking to everybody here, no matter whether you're the starter or whether you're the last person on the bench, every player will get an opportunity to play. Sometimes it's step right on in here. Come on, we just need you. And a lot of times it's somebody got fouled out, somebody this right here, somebody sick. That door only opens that much. And you gotta be prepared to stick that foot in that door. You gotta be ready. Because if not, you might not get the other chance. You might, you might not, it might be garbage time. It might be the game is over with. You know, it's only, you only a minute to go in the game and the game has already been decided. But you cannot let that affect how you play. You had to get out there and you had to work hard. You got to get out there, you got to run, you got to jump, you got to take your charge, you, you rebound, you got to die, you got to take going. You know this guy way ahead of your football player, but you got to run all the way down. Maybe he might cut back. You get an opportunity to make that tackle. Be of being prepared. Now, there's E.C. Coleman. Come all the way from Florida, Mississippi. Sharecropper's son. Three-room school all the way to the Mecca of basketball. You know, now those are my struggles. I know that each and every one of you got struggles. But if you just look at what I did, what I had to go through, maybe you might just say to yourself, if E.C. Coleman can go from that point and go all the way and to be able to sit across the table from two men who became president of the United States, who end up being honored by a school with the E.C. Coleman Award, to be voted most outstanding male student in 1973, and then invited back here to talk to you. If E.C. Coleman could do that, what excuse do you have? You might have extenuated circumstances, but you don't have an excuse. It's there for you. All you have to do is be prepared. My wife gave me a quote that I was going to say. The road to success is paved with steps of preparation. Stay one step ahead. Now, let me just talk about one other thing. Because there's three things that happened over the last month 
that made me think about something. One is I was at school, I find this little first grader. This first grader, I heard him say, I hate Donald Trump. Now I know that this first grader really don't know anything about Donald Trump. He just echoing what he heard his family members say. But let's just take it for conversation for it. Just to say, Donald Trump is the worst president that ever did do it. He's the worst president of all presidents. That his administration is a travesty, bordering on a tragedy. And that our way of life is threatened by his administration. So we just take that and we're just gonna set it aside. One other thing that I saw, we'll come back to that. One other thing I saw was an interview between President Obama and David Letterman, it's on Netflix. You, it's, a good, it's a good watch. You watch, it's called, and my next guest is. And it close to the end of this interview, President Obama said, Dave, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. And the question he wanted to ask David Letterman was, at all the success that you had, do, do you feel like you was lucky? But before Dave answered, President Obama said, look, he's, I see people who are success, and they, and they, they walk around like, I did it all by myself. It was me. I'm the thing. I did it. I did it. And never recognized the help that they got along the way. He said, the way that I have kept myself grounded is that I know that there are a lot of smart people out there who work hard, do everything right, never mess up, never reach the level that I reached, never reached the presidency of the United States. So I know that there's an amount of, I was prepared, but there was an amount of luck. And when Letterman was talking, he said this, he said, when I was preparing for this interview, I had, I went and interviewed John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, civil rights activist, uh, and they had a walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Anybody know what that is? Edmund Pettus Bridge, Bloody Sunday. And they walked across the bridge and they talked about that day, that week, the march from Selma to, to Montgomery and, and how it affected the world, and that this was probably one of the catalysts for, for Barack Obama becoming president of the United States. And Letterman said this here, and I, 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 it really was profound. He said, you know, during that week, my friends and I had found our way to the Bahamas, because in the Bahamas, you can buy liquor underage. And I spent that whole week <laughs> drunk, just having a good time. And he said, now I often wonder why I wasn't there. Why I wasn't aware that this type of thing was going on. Yes, I consider myself lucky. Because I was lucky enough that I, to be even sheltered away from this type of stuff. I didn't even know it was happening. Now, I'm going to tell you a quick story. It's 1955. A young boy living in Chicago, Illinois was going down to Mississippi, a place called Money, Mississippi, to visit his extended family for the first time. And his mom gave him the speech, not unlike what mothers are giving black kids about meeting the policeman. She told him, said, when you go down to Mississippi, if you meet up on a white person, don't look him in the eye, be polite, you know, try to, really just try to avoid him. But that boy was brought up in Chicago. I ain't scared of no white people. He goes down to Money, Mississippi, and he's enjoying his family. He's enjoying his family. He's standing outside the store, and this attractive white woman comes out, and supposedly he whistled at her. I said something. Two days later, a group of white men breaks into this boy's family home, drags him out of bed in the middle of the night in front of his family, who can only sit there and watch takes this young boy out into the woods and beat him to death and mutilated his body, tied to a, a tire uh, wheel and throw it into the Tallahassee River. The next day they found, well, two days later they found the boy's body, unrecognizable, all bloated, all except for the clothes. That boy's name was Emmett Till. Now who knows what Emmett Till may have accomplished in his lifetime, to be killed and body mutilated and thrown into the river simply for either whistling 
I mean, if, he didn't, if he had said, hey, baby, look at here, come here, that still was enough for this boy to lose his life. Now, that's a tragedy. But to the, the compound this tragedy, a few years ago, the lady who said that Lemon Hill whistled at her on her dying bed confessed that she told a lie. Now, that's a tragedy. Now, out of that tragedy, when Rosa Parks, it was 1955, when Rosa Parks was sitting on that bus and that man asked her to get up and give her a seat, she said that the image of Emmett Till's body that was plastered on every page newspaper in the country. And when people saw that picture, they said, this cannot be us. We are the greatest country in the world. This cannot be who we are. We are better than this. We must be better than this. That picture of Emmett Till filled Rosa Parks to not to get up from out of that seat and give it to a white person. Rosa Parks was not just tired, she was tired of. And she took a stand. So out of this great tragedy of a young man losing his life, filled a movement that changed the world. Change America made it possible for me to be standing here in front of you guys and for all of you guys to be standing there. We got all different uh, uh, nationalities, black, white, Hispanic, all different us to be able to stand here together. It filled us. Something good came out of a tragedy. So let's go back and pick up Donald Trump. Maybe with this thing that's happening with our political system, maybe that good people all over this country will say, we are the greatest country in the history of mankind, and we are. There, nobody can touch us. The greatest country in the history of mankind. Maybe we can do better than this. This cannot be us. This cannot be. We must do better, and some changes might be going. But it ain't going to happen. You know what's gonna, how it's going to happen? Because young people like you. You cannot be like David Letterman and not be aware. You have to get involved. You have to be informed. You cannot look at the book and look at that book and say, oh, oh, it's got a nice cover. That's a good book. You got to open the pages. You cannot look at the movie trail and say, wow, this is a good movie. You got to go see the movie. And you got to see it. And you cannot just listen to one person tell you that this is that. You got to get in opinions. You got to listen to opposing opinion. To be able to understand somebody, I can't, I mean, I can have my opinion, but I need to know why you feel that way. Please give me your argument. Convince me that you're right. And then I can form my own opinion, a true opinion about what's happening. So you have to get involved. You owe it to Emmett Till. You owe it to Megan Evers. You owe it to Cheney, Swerner, and Goodman. You owe it to James Meredith. You owe it to Martin Luther King. All of those people that came before you who worked so hard diligently to secure the rights that you are enjoying right now. I'm not just talking about black people because as Martin Luther King says, our destiny is tied up into your destiny. You cannot be full if I'm down. We all got to be lifted up together. America is like a gumbo. You got a gumbo, she take all these different ingredients who by themselves can stand alone and be good. But when you put all of these ingredients together, you end up with something really nice. Each one of those ingredients adds to the flavor of the dish. And each one of us can add to the flavor of the United States of America. We don't need to make America great. We can make it greater by not sitting at home, by not just going out every four years and voting, getting involved in civic activities, you know, helping people get to the polls to vote, helping people register, going down and helping young people at some type of uh, uh, club or something. 
just doing just a little bit more. It don't take a lot. Just a little bit. And if you and you and you and you and you and all you guys do just a little and we put it all together, guess what? We got a lot. All right. I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.